What if quantum theory is not just weird and counterintuitive, but genuinely contains contradictions? Today's paradox claims to show an internal contradiction in quantum theory. If this is true, it would be a really big deal. It would mean that quantum theory as we know it cannot be a universal theory that fully describes the world around us. Welcome back to the Quantum Paradoxes video series. In each episode, I explain a quantum thought experiment and how to understand it better using quantum computing. In my previous paradox videos, I've discussed some of the strange consequences of treating observers as quantum systems. For example, an observer could be in a superposition of seeing Schrodinger's cat being dead and seeing it alive. But while that may sound absurd, it is fully self-consistent with the laws of quantum mechanics. Today's thought experiment claims to show that quantum theory cannot be consistently applied to observers that themselves use quantum theory. I will show you how we can simplify this thought experiment into a quantum circuit and resolve the apparent paradox. The thought experiment was proposed by Daniela Frauchiger and Renate Renner in 2016. It involves four observers who use quantum mechanics to reason about the outcomes of each other's measurements. Then they find their conclusion to be in contradiction with quantum mechanics. It's an extension of the Wigner's friend paradox, so I've called it Wigner's friend of a friend of a friend. In the quantum community, it's often referred to as the Frauchiger Renner paradox or as an extended Wigner's friend thought experiment. If you haven't seen my previous video on Wigner's friend, I recommend watching that before watching this one. And if you're not familiar with Braquette notation and quantum gates like Hadamard and CNOT, then I recommend taking a look at the Basics of Quantum Information course on the IBM Quantum Learning Platform linked in the video description before continuing with this video. So here's a quick reminder of the circuit I used to represent the Wigner's friend thought experiment. Wigner's friend measures a qubit in superposition and then asks his friend what results they got. If observation causes irreversible collapse, then Wigner and his friend disagree on when the irreversible collapse happened, each believing that their observation caused the collapse. However, if we treat both Wigner and his friend as quantum systems, there is no contradiction. Their measurements both involved them being entangled with the measured system, modelled by control knot gates in the circuit. Now things get more complicated if Wigner makes a couple more friends. We'll start with Alice and Bob. And like in the Wigner's friend thought experiment quantum circuit, we'll represent each of their memories as qubits. Now Alice's qubit starts in a superposition state, so that when she measures this qubit, she'll have a third probability of measuring a zero and two thirds probability of measuring a one. Then if she measures a zero, her memory qubit will stay as zero. And if she measures a one, her memory qubit will be flipped to a one. In our quantum circuit, we'll implement this using a control knot gate. Then based on Alice's measurement outcome, she prepares Bob's qubit. If she measures a zero, then she prepares Bob's qubit in the zero state. And if she measures a one, then she prepares Bob's qubit in the plus state. This step will be implemented by a controlled Hadamard gate in the quantum circuit. Alice then gives this qubit to Bob and Bob measures this qubit, which again will represent as a control knot gate with Bob's memory qubit. So this gives us the final state vector. Now Bob can draw some conclusions about Alice's measurement from his measurement. If Bob gets a measurement outcome of one, then he knows for sure that Alice must have measured a one on her qubit, so that she prepared his qubit in the plus state and not the zero state. So let's code our quantum circuit so far and check these conclusions. Here is our quantum circuit so far. The first gate is a Y rotation gate that prepares Alice's qubit in the superposition. Then there's a C naught for Alice's measurement of her qubit. 
a controlled Hadamard between Alice's memory and Bob's qubit for Alice preparing Bob's qubit in the zero state if she measures a zero and the plus state if she measures a one. And finally, another C0 gate when Bob measures his qubit. Now let's check our conclusion that if Bob measures one, Alice must have measured one. I've added a measurement after Alice's memory qubit, after the control not gate, to tell us what she measured, and a measurement on Bob's memory qubit to see what he measured. Let's run the circuit and see the outcomes. We can see that if Bob measures a one on his qubit, then Alice must measure a one on her qubit, meaning that she prepared Bob's qubit in the plus state. Now, it gets weird if Charlotte and Danny enter the picture. Let's go back to the light board. Now, Alice and her qubit are completely isolated in Alice's lab, and Bob and his qubit are completely isolated in Bob's lab. Charlotte and Danny are both outside these labs, and we're going to assume that they have full quantum control over Alice and Bob's labs and their qubits. So Charlotte and Danny can choose to measure Alice and Bob in whatever bases they want. Now, normally we measure two qubits in the computational basis where we'll get outcomes of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. We can also measure two qubits in the Bell basis. So instead of checking if they're in states like 0, 0 and 1, 1, we check if they're in, for example, the phi plus state, which is 0, 0 plus 1, 1, or the phi minus state, which is 0, 0 minus 1, 1. Charlotte is now going to do a Bell basis measurement on Alice and her qubit to check which one of the four Bell basis states she will be in. And if Charlotte measures Alice and her qubit to be in the phi minus state, then we can see from this state vector that Bob must have definitely measured a one on his qubit. Let's check this on the quantum circuit. We can implement a Bell basis measurement by adding a C0 and then a Hadamard before doing two Z measurements. This is similar to how we can implement an X basis measurement by applying a Hadamard gate and then a Z measurement. So here I've added the measurements to Charlotte's qubit and I'll also add a measurement to Bob's qubit so that we can check our conclusion. When we run this, we can see that indeed, when Charlotte measures one zero, Bob always measures one. Now, we reasoned earlier that if Bob measures a one on his qubit, then it is certain that Alice measured a one on her qubit. So now when Charlotte gets her outcome of one zero, she can conclude that Bob measured a one and hence, by extension, Alice measured a one. Now let's go back to the light board for the final step. Just like Charlotte measured Alice and her qubit in the Bell basis, next, Danny measures Bob and his qubit in the Bell basis. We reasoned earlier that if Charlotte gets a final Z measurement outcome of zero one, that indicates that Alice and her qubit were in the phi minus state, therefore, Bob must have measured his qubit to be in the one state. Therefore, Alice must have measured her qubit to be in the one state so that she prepared Bob's qubit in the plus state. Now, if Bob measures a qubit in the plus state, then Bob and his qubit will jointly enter the phi plus entangled state, which is 0, 0 plus 1, 1. So if Charlotte measures Alice and her qubit to be in the phi minus state, then Danny should definitely measure Bob and his qubit to be in the phi plus state. This means we should never see a measurement outcome where Charlotte gets phi minus and Danny gets phi minus. Let's test this out with our quantum circuit. Here I've added Danny's Bell measurement to Bob's qubit and his memory so that we can see Charlotte and Danny's measurement outcomes. Remember that a measurement outcome of zero, zero corresponds to the phi plus state 
and 0, 1 corresponds to the phi minus state. We've just reasoned that Charlotte and Danny should never both measure phi minus, hence we should never see the outcome of 0, 1, 0, 1 in these measurements. Let's see what happens when we run our full circuit with Qiskit. You can see from running the circuit that we have a paradox. Charlotte and Danny can both measure 0, 1. It turns out that they can get this outcome with a probability of a 12th, which you can see from writing the global state vector in the Bell basis. So if the reasoning of the agents is correct, then quantum theory fails to describe observers' reasoning about quantum theory. In their original paper, Frauschke and Renner argued that we have to give up some of our standard assumptions of physics to avoid the paradox. Here, I'll explain my way of understanding where the reasoning of the observers that I described earlier actually goes wrong. I think the key problem here is in chaining together Charlotte's conclusion about Bob's past measurement outcome and Bob's conclusion about Alice's past measurement outcome. Let's look at where the measurements Charlotte, Alice and Bob make are on the quantum circuit. So we can see in this part is Charlotte's measurement, then in this part is where Bob's measurement takes place, and then in this part is where Alice's measurement takes place. Now, the basis in which Charlotte measures Alice is the Bell basis, whereas the basis in which Alice measured her qubit is the computational basis. In the same way that a quantum system can't have a definite state in the X and Z bases, Alice's lab can't have a definite state in the computational basis and Bell basis. This is another version of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, where a particle can't have definite position and momentum simultaneously. In the thought experiment, this means that it's fine for Charlotte to reason about Bob's past measurement outcome and Bob to reason about Alice's past measurement outcome, because each of those individual deductions happen in compatible bases that refer to different qubits. But Charlotte can't use Bob's conclusion about Alice's past measurement outcome, because that conclusion involves a measurement basis that's incompatible with Charlotte's measurement basis. This is very different to classical physics, where we have no problems chaining together deductions from different observers. Once we forbid the chaining together of Charlotte and Bob's deductions, there's no reason that Danny is forbidden from measuring phi minus, if Charlotte measures phi minus. Hence, there is no contradiction with quantum theory being applied to the reasoning about observations. This reasoning is enough to convince me that applying quantum theory to observers is self-consistent. But it remains an open topic of discussion within the quantum community. Different researchers have proposed different resolutions, and some believe that there are still subtleties to be resolved for example, to do with precisely describing the situations where observers can and can't use each other's deductions. I've shown you how to implement a qubit version of the thought experiment yourself using Qiskit, but there's an even more fundamental way that quantum computers can be involved in this thought experiment. A possible objection to the paradox is that coherent control over a human observer is technologically unrealistic, even in principle. A workaround is to replace the four human observers with four quantum computers, programmed to reason about their measurement outcomes. This removes the need for conscious agents. Some researchers have even developed a quantum software package enabling you to see what happens in the thought experiment when you use different assumptions on how your observers should reason about their measurement outcomes. In this setting, my resolution to the paradox is the same. The quantum computers should be programmed such that they do not chain together deductions that refer to qubits in different bases. Because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, when dealing with any kind of deductions in quantum theory, they can only be applied simultaneously if the relevant measurements are all made in compatible bases. That's how we avoid any variations of the Wigner's friend of a friend of a friend paradox. In the next video, we're heading right back to the 60s to explain what has been called the most beautiful experiment in physics, the famous double slit, which was used to demonstrate the phenomenon of wave-particle duality. 
You can find all the code for today's video in the Jupyter notebook linked in the description, along with the blog post with more information. See you next time for more quantum thought experiments.